We're going to talk a little bit more about a guy named Gideon. So if you are uh, with us here, I uh, got your Bibles. Uh, turn to Judges chapter 8. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, these are heavy. Okay. And we'll find out why we got those in a little bit. Uh, but we are in part four of this sermon series I'm on Gideon. We're talking about Gideon. And uh, he is an interesting, interesting guy. If you missed the last three, um, I'll just give you a little bit of quick rundown today. But uh, this is during the time of the judges. There was no king of Israel. God was their king, although they did not follow him as king most of the time. And so God would raise up oppressors to get them back on track, to oppress them. And so there's these peoples that lived around them. And in, in, in the story of Gideon, it's the, Midi, the Midianites. And God raised up the Midianites. And for seven years, they would oppress. They would come in at harvest time and take all of the Israelites' crops and kill their, uh, their cattle and take their meat and such. And uh, so then God, the people cried out and God raised up a leader named Gideon, a judge, and uh, to uh, overthrow the Midianites. But Gideon was a coward. He was not uh, really, you know, what you would just, if you were just looking at him, the way he was acting, you wouldn't say, yeah, that's the guy to lead the Israelites. But God called him and said, you're going to do it. And he was very reluctant. He kept questioning God. Um, but God says, no, you're the man, and I am going to deliver Israel by your hand. And so, it, so Gideon raises up an army of 32,000 people. And uh, God says, that's too many. That's what we talked about last week. God says, 32,000 is too many. Uh, you're going to glorify yourselves. You're going to think that, that you did this and not me. But this is going to be my battle. Uh, and so uh, God whittles down that army from 32,000 to 300. So it's going to be 300 Israelites against 135,000 Midianites. 135,000 to 300. That's one to 450, uh, the ratio. Uh, so battle's big. It's impossible. And uh, God leads Gideon to do it. They surround uh, at night the Midian camp. With the 300 people were uh, up on a hill as the, the Midianites were in a valley. They put uh, torches inside a clay pot so they couldn't see, the army couldn't see the, the Israelites around them. And then they, at the sound of when Gideon told them, they all blew a ram's horn. So you just, and then they shouted for the Lord and for Gideon. And they broke the uh, clay pots and now Around the Midianite camp, they're seeing all these lights that were surrounded, and it's Gideon's army, and they're going to kill us. And they panicked, and God created this confusion, and they started killing each other. And then uh, Gideon and his men ran after them. They called uh, the others who, had, who God had whittled off, the, the other 32,000-some, uh, said, hey, come back, and we got them, uh, and so just help us keep going. And so then they went, and they killed off, we're going to find out, 120,000 Midianites. So that's how the story ended last week, and let's pray as we go into uh, Judges chapter 8, the conclusion of the story, which is the oft- not told uh, story of Gideon. Dear God, we ask this morning that you would, uh, you would speak through your word, speak through me as I, as, I, as, I, as I try and articulate what it is you're saying to us through this, and Lord, speak into our spirits. Uh, may your spirit communicate with our spirit in a way that, that we can say, okay, this is what we need to do. May we not hear 
Pastor Jeremy's thoughts. But we may, may we hear your thoughts, what it is that you are saying to each one of us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's start reading that story in Judges chapter 8. It says, the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us, not calling us when you went to fight against the Midianites? Okay, now what, what are they asking? Who are the men of Ephraim? That is one of the tribes of Israel. And uh, they were called upon at the very end of the story last week. So Gideon is going after them. And then the tribes of the north uh, that were part of helping them, tribes of Manasseh and Naphtali and uh, I can't remember all of them, uh, but the, you know, Zebulun, the Asher, they, they came to help Gideon go after the 132,000 as they were running and fleeing from them. And, and then as they, were going, as, the, as they were pursuing the Midianites south towards the land of Ephraim, that tribe, uh, Gideon called the Ephraimites and said, hey, Go help us, you know, go get them. And so then they came from the south as the others were coming from the north. And the, Eph- the, 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 the people of Ephraim killed off two of their princes, Oreb and Zeb, and cut their heads off. And this is the part of the story that we don't really talk about much because it doesn't make for a nice flannel graph, uh, right? Uh, guy holding... The head uh, chopped off and, and stuff. So uh, let's continue. Uh, this chapter gets, you know, it's, it's, it's not your normal. Well, it, is, it, is, it happens a lot in, in the book of Judges. It's kind of a chapter, but uh, we don't preach on it a whole lot. All right. Uh, so it says, and they argued with him violently. They were upset because... Gideon only called them at the end. He didn't call them for the main battle. And he says, you know, why have you done this? You didn't call us to go fight against the Midianites. We would have gone. And so he said to them, what have I done now compared to you? Is not the gleaning of Ephraim better than the grape harvest of Abiezer? God handed over to you, Oreb and Zeb, the two princes of Midian. What was I able to do compared to you? When he said this, their anger against him subsided. So, it, you know, they're saying, hey, you didn't include us in the battle. And they said, well, I, you know, Gideon's like, I did. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, you weren't there for the initial part of it, but you got Oreb and Zeb. You got the two princes. Uh, you know, what is it? Compa- you, know, you got that big spoil, and that's probably what they were more concerned about is when the victors get the spoils, right? You get the, the gold and whatever it is that your, your enemy had. And they're like, you know, we weren't part of this. So look, at, you got the notoriety of killing off these two princes. Uh, you know, what does that compare to what, what I did? And they're like, eh, okay, you got a point there, get in. All right, and that's, so that, that subsides, their, their anger subsides, and the story continues. It's Gideon. And the 300 men came to the Jordan and crossed it. So now they're going um, uh, be east across the Jordan. Uh, and uh, they were exhausted but still in pursuit. So now it's after Gideon talks to uh, the, the, the people from Ephraim, it's just he and his 300 pursuing the Midianite army, what's left of them, which is still a lot more than their 300. It says, they were exhausted but still in pursuit. He said to the men of Succoth, please give some loaves of bread to the troops under my command because they are exhausted for I am pursuing Ziba and Zalmana, the kings of Midian. Okay, so uh, what is Gideon doing here? He's going after uh, the, the two kings. Oreb and Zeb were princes. But there's still two kings. And he's like, why are there two kings of Midian? Why wouldn't there be one king of Midian? Midian isn't a nation that has a king. Uh, So many of the peoples back then, the Canaanites and the Midianites and all these people, they were tribal groups. And uh, so 
each kind of tribal group had their own king. I mean, we, we see in the, at the end of the book of uh, Numbers, Moses it says killed five kings of the Midianites. So they were known to have multiple kings. It wasn't just one king over all, they weren't that united over all the Midianites. Uh, so uh, he's going after Ziba and Zalmana, uh, the kings of Midian. And he's in pursuit of them. And he comes to a town called Sakoth, which is in the tribe of Gad, uh, of an Israelite tribe, but over in the area where the Midianites uh, were from or closer to where they are from. The Midianites are trying to get home. The, the Midianite army trying to get away from Gideon and get home, and they're going through Gad. And so, the, so Gideon comes to this town of Succoth, and they say, hey, our troops, they're hungry. They need food. And these are Jews that they're talking to, fellow Jews. And as they were pursuing Ziba and Zalmana. Verse 6 says, but the princes of Sakoth said, are Zaba and Zalmanah now in your hands that we should give bread to your army? And Gideon replied, very well then. When the Lord has handed Zaba and Zalmanah over to me, I will tear your flesh with thorns and briars from the wilderness. He went from there to Penuel and he asked them the same thing. The men of Penuel answered just as the men of Succoth had answered. He also told the men of Penuel, when I return safely, I'll tear down this tower, their stronghold. It says, now Zaba and Zalmanah were in Karkor, and with them was their army of about 15,000 men who were all those left of the entire army of the people of the east, the Midianites. Those who had been killed were 120,000 men. So Gideon's army had killed 120,000 people. There's 15,000 left. But that's still 15,000 compared to Gideon's little 300. That's still 1 in 50 uh, ratio. Though, uh, Gideon traveled on the caravan route east of Nabah and Jogbaha and attacked their ar army while the army felt secure. Ziba and Zalmanah fled and he pursued them. He captured these two kings of Midian and routed the entire army. Gideon, son of Joash, returned from the battle by the ascent of Harry's. He captured a youth from the men of Succoth and interrogated him. The youth wrote down for him all the names of the 77 leaders and the elders of Sakath. Then he went to the men of Sakath and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmanah. You taunted me about them, saying, Are Zeba and Zalmanah now in your power that we should give bread to your exhausted men? So he took the elders of the city and he took some thorns and briars from the wilderness. And he disciplined the men of Sakoth with them. He tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. Not the happy part of the story of Gideon uh, that we know, right? Uh, so Gideon, with his 300s, in pursuit of the Midianites, comes to Sakoth, asks for food. They said, we're not giving you any food because you might lose. And then we have now supported the losers. And then the Midianites are going to come after us because we helped you. You're not a winner yet. There's only 300 of you. They just saw 15,000 men pass by. And they said, nah, we're not helping you. They're still stronger than you. You don't have Zalmana and uh, Zaba in your hands yet that we should help you. And Gideon says, well, they're going to be in my hands. And when I, once they are, I'm coming back and you are going to be punished. And uh, then he goes to Penuel and the same thing. They say, yeah, we're not helping you uh, because we're, we're scared, basically. Uh, you, you haven't conquered them. You haven't won yet. And so he says, well, I'm going to come back and I'm going to tear down this tower. So they, keep, they go on and I think we got a map here, yeah? Uh, so here's their, their route. You can see uh, the, black, the black lines. The purple lines are the, the, you know, the people from Naphtali, Zebulun, Asher, and Manasseh who come together and then follow down along the Jordan. 
uh, the Midianite army. Ephraim, down here in the south, this region down here, uh, they come down at Gideon's request, and they kill at Beth Barah, this red dot, um, Oreb and Zeb, and then Gideon goes on across here and chases them with his 300 across the Jordan River and into this area's Gad, and they go through Sakath, Penuel, and then they finally conquer them down in Karkor. Uh, and then they're going to now make their way back, and they're going to come back through Penuel and Sakath and say, look it, here are the two kings that you wouldn't help us. You said you wouldn't help us unless we had them. We got them, and I said, once we have them, I'm coming back to punish you. And so he gets briars, he gets thorn bushes, and he whips these leaders, the elders, that he'd asked this young man, he says, hey, who are the elders in your town? And he wrote down the names of all the elders in their town, and Gideon then had them whipped with these uh, thorn bushes, tore their flesh off, um, as it says. And then uh, goes to Penuel. And not only takes down the tower that he said he was going to take down, but killed the men in the city, and probably meaning the elders uh, of that city as well. Probably not all the men, but, but we don't know, which is the, the men in the city. So uh, what's going on with Sakath, and what, what, what can we learn from Penuel? Uh, they did not help Gideon, the Lord's army. They were afraid. They were fearful, just like Gideon was early on. Um, and we, as we, we talked about this sermon the last few weeks, I've couched it in the idea of being on mission, right? And that our, our mission is first to glorify God, which means we love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul, and then we love one another as ourselves. We fulfill the great commandment, right? Uh, to, or the great, yeah, the great commandment. Uh, love God, love others. And then the great commission to go in all the world and make disciples, tell people about Jesus, help them become followers, become like Jesus. So that is what we are about. We're to be about now as individuals, as part of the church. Uh, we are uh, to be on fulfilling the great commandment and the great commission. But we get off mission so often. Today I want to look at see some of the things that, that can get people off mission. Penuel and Sakath, these two cities, were off mission. When Joshua came uh, across the Jordan, when he led the people years before this um, and conquered the people of that land uh, and then gave out all the, they said, okay, Asher, you get this land, and Zebulun, you get this land, and uh, Ephraim, you get this land, and, and divided up among the 12 tribes, he said, choose this day who you will serve. Right? Choose this day. Are you going to serve the gods of this land or are you going to serve the one true living God who delivered us out of Egypt? Choose this day who you will serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And what's now Penuel and Succoth doing? Along with most of Israel. They were serving the gods of the land. They were not putting God first. You've got Gideon, who God has called, who is leading this army, who is 300 chasing 15,000, and they could not get on board with God's mission because they were so concerned about themselves and self-preservation. And likewise, we too, point one, we get off mission when our world revolves around us rather than God's plan. It's so easy to care more about ourselves than we care about God and others and God's purpose on earth, what God is doing. We got to make sure that we get our eyes off of ourselves. And so, you know, it's something you can look at, you know, yourself and say, do I care more about the comforts of this world? Do I care more about making a life for myself and a name for myself? Or am I constantly thinking about God's plan and the lost? Do I care that there are people going to hell in this world? 
We get off mission when our world revolves around us rather than God's plan. Let's, let's continue with the story in verse, verse 18. It says, he asked Zabah and Zalmanah, what kind of men did you kill at Tabor? So now he's got his prisoners, the king. He says, what were these guys that you killed uh, at Tabor? What, tell, tell me about them, right? And they say, they were like you, they said. Each resembled the son of a king. So he said, they were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As the Lord lives, if you had let them live, I would not kill you. Then he said to Jether, his firstborn, get up and kill them. The youth did not draw his sword, for he was afraid because he was still a youth. Uh, I'd probably be the same even as a non-youth, all uh, right? Uh, but Zabah and Zalmanna said, Get up and strike us down yourself, Gideon, for a man is judged by his strength. So Gideon got up and killed Zabah and Zalmanna and took the crescent ornaments, those are the moon-shaped crescent ornaments that were on the necks of their camels. Then the Israelites said to Gideon, Rule over us. You as well as your sons and your grandsons, for you delivered us from the power of Midian. But Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. Then he said to them, let me make a request of you. Everyone give me an earring from his plunder. Now the enemy had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. They said, we agree to give them. So they spread out a cloak and everyone threw an earring from his plunder on it. The weight of the gold earrings he requested was 43 pounds of gold. In addition to the crescent ornaments and ear pendants, the purple garments on the kings of Midian and the chains on the necks of the camels. Gideon made an ephod from all this and put it in Oprah, Ophrah, uh, his hometown. Then all Israel prostituted themselves by worshiping it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and his household. Started out so well here, right? Uh, he says, okay, um, they want me to be king. I'm not going to be the king. You know, God is our king. I'm not going to rule over you. My kids aren't going to rule over you. God's going to rule over you. God is your king. But can you give me some gold, right? And so they'd killed off the Ishmaelites, which is another, the Midianites were Ishmaelites, right? Uh, and so it's saying they had gold earrings. The men wore gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. Ishmaelites were descendants of Ishmael, Abraham's firstborn son before Isaac. Right? which is where the Muslims trace their uh, ancestry to. They are children of Ishmael. And so, you know, the, the, the camels have these crescent moon, which is still the symbol today uh, in, in Muslim, that crescent moon uh, shape. So the Midianites are Ishmaelites, one and the same. And uh, so they had these gold earrings. And so the, from the men, the 120,000 men that they killed, they took the gold earrings and they gave Gideon an earring. Uh, and he laid it out and it weighed, in this version it says 43 pounds of gold. It was a certain amount of shekels. And it all really depends on how much a shekel weighed at that time because they could vary in size just on, uh, so it could be anywhere from 35 pounds to 75 pounds. And he made an ephod out of this. An ephod, I think I got a picture of that here, um, is what the priest, the high priest wore. So the high priest wore an ephod. It's, this, it's the, uh, the white part, the, the apron kind of, Thing there, and on it had uh, different kinds of stones, colorful stones. Uh, it was made of linen, uh, but it also had uh, sewn in there blue and purple and scarlet yarn and gold thread. Uh, you know, it was a nice thing. And, and in the the chest, there was the breastplate of judgment, 
where it had the Urim and the Thummim, two stones that were called seer stones, uh, to try and when, they, when the priest needed to know what was God leading them to do, they, he put these Urim and Thummim in his breast plate, and we don't really understand much about this. The Bible doesn't tell us a whole lot about it, but that was kind of how he discerned the will of God. Now, what is, like, he, so he made this, the, the ephod is typically, like, it's, it's out of linen, but he made an ephod out of gold. He melted the gold earrings and made an ephod out of it. We're going to see how heavy an ephod is, come, or this ephod is that Gideon made. Come on, Claire. I'm going to have you wear this backpack, which weighs well, not very much, right? And we're going to put in. 10 pounds. Is that it? <laughs> it's already heavy. She's, okay. Uh, we're going to put in another 10 pounds. That's 20 pounds. Okay? We're not even there yet to the minimum. All right, it's got to be 35 uh, pounds. So that's, that's 25 uh, or 20 pounds. These are two more five pounds. So that gets to 30 pounds. How does that feel? Not good. Okay. Uh, and then here's 35. That's the lightest that that ephod would have been. Would you like to wear that? Nope. nope. <laughs> All right. Uh, should we go higher? Here, let's, you don't care? All right, let's go for it. All right, let's put in a 25-pounder. This will put us to what's 25 pounds and 35 pounds. Claire, do the math quick. Come on, to summer. Quickly, 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 60 pounds. How does that feel? Do you need me to help you? Your legs are wobbling. Okay, let's just take that off. We haven't even got up to six to 75 pounds. It could be as much as 75 pounds. Graham, it's your birthday. Come on up here. Put that on. This is just 60 pounds. What did I say, 60 pounds? Go ahead, put that on. <laughs> Come on, you got it, buddy. <laughs> All right, here. Go ahead. Put, here, right now, come here. Put it on. So you can feel how heavy that is. <laughs> All right, I won't kill you. All right, okay, thank you. Happy birthday. All right, uh, so 60 pounds, I mean, that's a child, obviously, they're not going to wear that. But even a grown man, I mean, that th this was. I make it look easy, right? Uh, yeah, but no. Um, it's, it's heavy, especially when you do it like that. Um, I wouldn't want to wear this thing. I don't think that Gideon was wearing this ephod. He didn't make this to, to wear. Possibly he could have, uh, but unlikely. But they, it says that they prostituted themselves with it. They means they, when it, that, that term is used... Uh, different times in the Old Testament, when they went and they followed false gods, they worshiped idols. It's like they're cheating on God and prostituting themselves with this idol. So they made an idol of the ephod. People worshiped the ephod rather than God. This is Gideon. Gideon did this. And how did this whole story start with him tearing down the altar to Baal and the Asherah to Baal's wife? And in his, you know, when God said, you need to go tear this stuff down, and he was afraid to do it during the day, but he did it at night, and he tore down the altar to Baal and, and erected an um, altar to God. And all this is about worshiping the one true God rather than idols, and here he goes and makes an ephod and... It led the people astray. It says even Gideon and his household. Why did he do this? We don't know. <laughs> but my guess, okay, and ephod is a strange choice, right? He could make this into anything. He could make it into a calf like uh, they oftentimes uh, did or something like that. But he made it into an ephod. Why the ephod? Uh, why the high priest? 
Gideon has just had in the story an amazing encounter with the one true God, right? The angel of the Lord came and visited him. You know, and he knew that this was a messenger from God, but he didn't know it was the angel of the Lord, that he was actually standing in the presence of God uh, until the, the angel burnt up his offering. And he says, how am I still alive? Because I just, you know, was in the, in the presence of God. That's how all this started. And then God is communicating with him and telling him how to lead this army and what to do. He had an amazing connection to God, didn't he? Kind of like a priest, And I think Gideon was saying, I'm not going to be your king. God is your king, but I'll be your priest. I'm going to be the one who talks to God for us. And he was not a Levite. He was not a priest. So he, he got off mission. And he started worshiping the experience rather than the one who gave him the experience. Point number two, we get off mission when we elevate experience over the one who gave the experience. We do this in our lives where we have an encounter with God. And then it becomes about that feeling or that moment, that experience, rather than what God is doing. What, what, who God is worshiping him, we can, we can worship experiences. We can try and create it with music. Uh, some people worship music rather than the one who it, we're worshiping through the music. We're supposed to be worshiping. It's all about stirring up certain kind of emotions and, and, and get these experiences, get these feelings or maybe God worked in some supernatural way and then we just live in that moment and that, that time rather than what God is wanting to do still. And maybe he wants to do something differently. Or we like the hymns and God spoke to us through the hymns so it's always got to be hymns and we can't move on to other kind of music that might reach other people in a younger generation. Because we're living in the past rather than what God is trying to do now. And we are trying to control God and put God in a box so he has to perform and do things the way that we want him to do it. We can, we can live for traditions and gifts and uh, feelings. Trying to repeat the past rather than seeking God now for uh, what he wants to do so that he can meet us as he chooses now. Uh, and so that he can uh, lead us in the future as he wills. Have we surrendered to him or are we making an idol of the past? We can get off mission when we do that, as Gideon here did. And we also, we get off mission, point three, when we become okay with the small sins. Gideon did not set up an altar to Baal. He did not go back to Baal worship. But you're not supposed to have any kind of an idol. And he's like, well, you know, it's, it's an ephod. It's priestly. And it's, you know, and, and so he kind of just like justified it. And we do that too in our lives. And we get off mission when we become, we become okay with, with what we consider small sins. Gideon resisted the obvious sin, but he missed the less obvious. He says, yeah, God's your king, but he went and lived like a king. He asked for the gold, the, the purple robes and all that. We're going to see more of the things that he, uh, he did uh, that got him off uh, target. But um, we think... A lot of times, the small stuff's no big deal, right? Uh, we need to treat all sins seriously. It's 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 obvious. Like you know, when when Satan is is attacking, like if he said, "Okay, this is the Christian life. Do this," right? That would be too obvious, right? Uh, God, Satan doesn't come and try and tr try and. Uh, get us off course by a, a, a 180. He tries to get us to veer off course just with small little sins and 
and changes of, of course, to, to, to where we veer to the wrong direction until at some point we're, we're just way off. And if we don't treat the little sins as serious, we're going to get off course. Proverbs 4.23 says, Guard your heart above all else, for it is the source of life. Are we guarding our hearts? Are we guarding our purity? Are we guarding our relationship with God? Above all else, it says, for it is the source of life. This is where God works in us and speaks through, through into us and, and through us. Are we missing out on God's blessing because we've, we've allowed too much corruption inside? Maybe it's small stuff in our minds, but it's affecting us. I'll give you a few examples of small sins that the, that the Bible points out and how that they affect us. Ephesians 4, 26, 27. Paul writes, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger and don't give the devil an opportunity. We can be angry. Anger is going to happen and, it's, and stuff, but, but don't let the sun go down on your anger. It means resolve that quickly. If you've got some pro problem with somebody else, go and resolve it. How often do we do that? How often out of love do we go and try and reconcile the relationships in our lives that are broken? Or how often do we sit in the anger and the frustration and the hurt and we give the devil a foothold in our life, as it says. And so, so the devil has this opportunity or this foothold in our lives because of these unmended relationships. Another one, 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight through 30. Paul's talking about uh, the Lord's Supper. And when people were coming in, in, in Corinth, they were coming for the Lord's Supper, which was more than just uh, a little cup of wine and a little piece of bread, but it was a meal together. And people would come and they wouldn't think about the people that were late or the poor or whatever. They just came and they started chowing down only thinking about themselves. And Paul says here, he says, let a person examine himself in this way, let him eat bread and drink from the cup. For whoever eats and drinks without recognizing the body, which means not our body, he's talking about the body of Christ, the family, the church family. You're not thinking about other people, you're just thinking about yourselves eats and drinks judgment on himself. This is why many are sick and ill among you, and many have fallen asleep, meaning died. You see, there are lots of you who are sick, and you're not sick just because you caught a cold or something. You're sick because you are caring more about yourselves than everybody else in the church. Because there is disunity among you, it is causing physical ailments, even death. How often do we think about that, whether that actually we might be struggling because of sin in our lives that we have, that we have not reconciled, that we have not repented of. It doesn't mean just because you get sick that it's because of sin, but it could be. The Bible says, I'm not, that's what Paul said. 1 Peter 3, 7, another example. It says, husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with a weaker partner, showing them honor as co-heirs of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. Now, I know that sounds weird, right? A weaker partner. Uh, it, the Greek word is vessel, and I'm not sure why the NIV and the CBD, uh, not CBD, uh, uh, this version, CSP, uh, change that uh, to a weaker partner. Um, that's an interpretation that is added there. It's a weaker vessel. And what, they're, what he's talking about is how do you, like a, like a porcelain vase, how do you carry and treat a porcelain vase? You don't just toss it around. It's not a, a piece of plastic Tupperware, uh, you know, that you can just drop. You're careful with it. And men, 
Love your wives in an understanding way, in a way that is careful with them. They're precious. That's what he's saying. And, and show them honor. That means place value upon them as co-heirs of the grace of life. Don't treat your wives poorly. With, don't disrespect them so that your prayers will not be hindered. So the way that men we treat our wives can affect our prayer life. If we say, well, gosh, my prayers is only go up to the ceiling. God never answers my prayers. Well, how are you treating your wife? Oh, that's a small sin. That's nothing big. How I treat my wife is not a big deal. That's, just, that's what I... These small sins affect and our, our lives and get us off of mission. Because we can have ailments in our lives. We can have prayers that aren't being answered. We can have relational problems. We, we give the, the, the devil a foothold in our lives when we don't take the small sins seriously. And that's what Gideon did. Gideon says, oh, it's not that big a deal. I'm not erecting a, an altar to Baal. I'm not going into Baal worship. I'm just making an ephod. Because, yeah, God talked to me. I'm like a priest. Let's continue with the story. It says in verse 28, it says, So Midian was subdued before the Israelites, and they were no longer a threat. The land had peace for 40 years during the days of Gideon. Good things still happened. Jerob, uh, Jerobel, that is Gideon, son of Joash, went back to live at his house. Gideon had 70 sons. Wow. Uh, his own offspring... Since he had many wives. Do you know who had many wives? Kings. It was one of the warnings. Uh, when, in it, when Israel said, give us a king, God said, you don't want a king. This is what they're going to do. They're going to tax you. They're going to take your money. Uh, they're going to take your wives. They're going to multiply their wives. And, and you shouldn't be doing this. He had 70 wives. Uh, or it says he had many wives, sorry, 70 sons, many wives. His concubine, and so now not only did he have wives, but now he's a concubine in Shechem, also bore him a son, and he named him Abimelech. Do you know what Abimelech means? It means son of a king. So Gideon names his son son of a king. Oh, but the Lord will rule over you. The Lord is your king. Right, Abimelech? Then Gideon, son of Joash, died at a good old age, which means he was blessed. He was still blessed. And was buried in the tomb of his father Joash in Ophrah of the uh, uh, Abiezrites, which is his clan. When Gideon died, the Israelites turned and prostituted themselves by worshiping the Baals and made Baal Berith their God. The Israelites did not remember the Lord their God who had rescued them from the hand of the enemies around them. They did not show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, that is Gideon, for all the good he had done for Israel. Gideon didn't worship Baal. He kept the people from doing that. But as soon as he died, they went back to worshiping Baal. Why? Because it was, it was an external worship of God. How often do we worship God just culturally, externally, but there's no inward change in our lives. And how often do we impress that on our children? You got to look this way. You got to act this way. You got to make sure you go to church. You got to do all of these things that outwardly look Christian, but inwardly they're void of the Holy Spirit because they've never given their lives to the Lord because we've never given our lives to the Lord because we are just serving God externally as cultural Christians. Don't be a cultural Christian because you'll keep your kids in line as long as you've got control of them. But what happens when they leave after high school? They go and they rebel and they go and live the life how they want to live life. They leave the church as so many do. Because what you do in their home, how you worship God in your home is more important than how you worship God on a Sunday morning. Your kids see it. And all the Israelites, as soon as Gideon was gone, went back to worshiping Baal. 
You know, when church is optional, I heard this, this saying, I don't know what pastor said this, but I saw this uh, just recently. When church is optional to you, it will be unnecessary to your children. When church is optional to you, it will be unnecessary to your children. Because our children learn from us and they go in the same. We, we, go, we take one step in the wrong direction, they take two. We've got to be careful how we live. Now, it's easy to get on Gideon. Gideon did a lot of bad things. But I mean, he did a lot of heroic things too. And this, that's why the, the, it's, it's so many stories in the Bible. The hero is not the human. The hero is God. And the hero of this story, who delivered the Israelites, it wasn't Gideon, it was God. And that was the whole thing was to not give glory to Gideon. But what happened? Gideon didn't get the message. He brought glory to himself. And we are not much different. But here's the cool thing. Even with all his failures, Gideon is still mentioned in the he- what we call the Hebrew Hall of Fame. Hebrews chapter 11. If you got a chance, turn there real quick. Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 32. We live in a culture called cancel culture, right? Somebody does one thing wrong and we cancel them. They have no more voice because, yeah, we're, gonna, we're just going to exaggerate that one thing that they said or did, and we don't extend grace. It's a good thing that God is not a God of cancel culture. Hebrews 11, 32 through 38, we see in this chapter all the bad things in, 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 in Judges 8, what, what Gideon did. Hebrews 11, he goes... Before this, he's talking about, you know, Moses and Abraham and all these men of great faith. And then it says, and what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. And this is probably Gideon's here. Gained strength. In weakness, and became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings, as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They died by the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins, in goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. These people that lived on mission, they cared more about God's plan than their own plan. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. And it says here in Hebrews 12, the next chapter, it starts off this way. Therefore... Since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses, these people that have gone before us, surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy that laid before him, before Jesus, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. If Jesus did that for us, what are we doing? Why can't we do that for him? Let's get on mission. Let's forget about our weaknesses. Let's focus on God's strength. Satan wants to cancel you. Satan wants to say, you're not enough. You can't do it. Look at your sins. Look at this. God can't use you. And God's saying, just like he did with Gideon, I can use you. Because I'm the hero. You're not the hero. So let's forget about our weakness. Focus on God's strength. Let's take our eyes off of ourselves and our comfort and our pleasures And do what God is calling us to do. Let's get on mission. We're going to 
close, or we're going to sing a song of response. It's a beautiful song uh, called, Oh Lord, You're Beautiful, that really encapsulates all of what we've been talking about in Israel. And loving God so much that it changes our lives. And if we love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all our soul, we are going to live for him, going to live on mission. So uh, listen to these words and pray them. And and if, if God's trying to get a hold of your heart and you feel that conviction, Pray this as a, as a prayer of commitment and a confession and saying, yeah, I'm gonna, I, I want to start serving you as my Lord, not myself. Dear God, we fail you all the time. Yet you still call us your children. You still love us, even in our worst. You use broken people. Thank you. Thank you for loving us when we didn't deserve it. Help us to give that same kind of grace to the people around us, the people in the church, the people outside the church, to love as you loved. And it's your kindness, Paul wrote, that leads us to repentance. And may we show that same kindness to those who are lost. May we show them your kindness. Help us, Lord, to get on mission. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.